welcome to Creative Block. Today, I am your host, V. On Creative Block, we interview people in creative industries about their life, work, and hobbies while we doodle jam. We ask people on our social medias if they have specific topics they wanted us to discuss, as well as some drawing prompts. And today, we have Drew Green. Hi! Hello! <laughs> it's me, Drew. It is! <laughs> I'm so excited for you to be here because I feel like I've followed you online for a really long time, but we've, we haven't gotten the chance to work together yet. So this is really fun. Yeah. It's a small world, but it's not small enough. <laughs> <laughs> we have like a, a ton of questions from our listeners and I like that they're a little bit in chronological ish order. So uh, I think I'm going to, get right into it sure yeah thanks to our listener from youtube at noth lit kc l 5734 <laughs> do you remember your earliest drawing at what was it oh my gosh <laughs> um i don't remember my earliest drawing i was drawing since i was probably about three years old i was really young but I remember I remember drawing a lot of like drawing a lot of things from like video game m instruction manuals. So I drew a lot of a lot of like Mario characters and Mega Man characters. I'm 35, so I'm like the NES was still a thing when I was a kid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we're like the same age. Are you 89 as well? 89. Yeah, my birthday was um was January 6th, the cursed day. So, um, so <laughs> happy birthday, though. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'm... So, wait, are you are you Sagittarius? No, Capricorn or Capricorn? Capricorn. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love the zodiac. We don't have to get really deep into it. But... <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not super invested, but it's it sure is fun. <laughs> but yeah, I'm a Capricorn, so I'm emotionally withdrawn <laughs> and i know everything uh but you work a lot <laughs> i do that's very true so yeah you were talking about like mostly just like like from nintendo manuals yeah like yeah. those drawings are just so appealing i and... know what a place to like what a place to learn from right mm -hmm. do you feel like you were mostly copying or were you like drawing from imagination or a mix of both it always started with copying but like I don't, I'm sure some of your listeners are familiar with the, the Koopalings. I'm still obsessed with them to this day. They're like seven, now eight perfect character designs. And um, I remember drawing them from the manuals, copying, but then like, you know, drawing my own fan art um, before we really had like a term for that when I was, you know, a kid. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I remember making up a lot of Mega Man bad guys too. Like that was a big thing for me, especially Mega Man X. Cause the bad guys were usually animal, like something animal. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm like, yeah, I'll have like, I don't know, magma. I'm looking around my office. What's an animal magma sea lion. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I don't know. It was, it was kind of that thing. Yeah. So my imagination was, was, was doing some of the work too nice yeah, yeah it's kind of like uh yeah i think that's where pokemon is so smart like when you're saying like magma sea lion that feels like that's pokemon <laughs> yeah i mean certainly when i was around that age like 10 11 i was drawing a lot of pokemon a lot of digimon um making up my own pre pretending i was like a pokemon trainer i mean this is like this is probably par for the course for, for yeah. the people listening yeah um, yeah yeah but yeah <laughs> Well, so I'm just going like, to give a quick shout out to Figment, I think, who, uh, so I guess that, that's pretty much when you realize that you love drawing, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I I just, you know, so I, I come from a, a really poor family. We didn't have a lot, you know, we, we scraped by and things were tough and drawing was my escape. Mm. So yeah, drawing was always really important to me and I'm glad I have it, it it's a good thing to be able to do. Yeah. It's a good thing to be able to make your own escape and your own your own sort of sanctuary in your head, you know? Yeah, I agree. I feel like that's very relatable. I feel like also when I was like a kid and you know, like we didn't we didn't really have like a, a ton of 
things to kind of take a hold of our attention like nowadays i guess <laughs> right. so when you were yeah. bored at least like with a piece of paper and a pen you could just like be very entertained <laughs> yeah no uh, oh, for sure <laughs> did you go to art school no i didn't i'm actually a high school graduate oh that's so cool i love getting these stories heck yeah oh let's get into it <laughs> yeah i you know i didn't go to school sometimes i wish i did i certainly don't regret the lack of of college debt yeah <laughs> i definitely i i wish that i had the i wish i had some of the experiences my peers had but i've landed in a pretty good place mm -hmm. and yeah I'm, I'm proud of that can you <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how you, so when you graduated from high school, what was your, mm -hmm. like, what was your plan? Did you get a, like a job and did you want to like, with, with your long-term goal of getting in the animation industry or what was that? Um... You know, for the longest time, I thought I would end up in comics mm. and I did, I did some comics work and I had, you know, I had, um, I had a web comic, you know, who didn't in 2009. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't initially see myself going into animation. Uh, I just never really thought about it. Mm -hmm. But as I started to get into my sort of early mid 20s, I was like seeing my friends move to California, seeing seeing people enjoy success in animation and doing something with their lives. And I got sort of tired of scraping by on commissions and the odd comics work here and there and just decided it was, you know, time to pack up and move to California and hope it worked out. I, I also have to say, like, I've always been able to enjoy animation and be critical about it, but still enjoy it mm -hmm. um, the way that I find I'm, I'm not as good at sort of turning my brain off. And enjoying it for what it is with other with other mediums. So, mm. so yeah, I just knew that it was it was going to be a good fit. Oh, that's awesome! I, I want to get into that a little bit more later, but I also want to ask you, where are you from originally? You're like, where uh, did you move from? Uh, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. <clears throat> oh, because there's a little yeah. bit of an animation industry there as well. It's but it's kind of small, right? Yeah, I mean, even at the time it was there was, but you know, it was a lot of like adult primetime stuff, which now I have some experience in, but at the time I, mm. I didn't, and yeah, I just knew that I wanted to come out here and work in kids media. Mm. Um, that's where that's where my love for cartoons generally lies. So yeah, I I never I never ended up actually working in animation when I was in Atlanta. Mm. I did I did try, you know. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, back then I wanted to work in design. You know, I would end up ultimately becoming a board artist when I came out here. And, and I think that was the best transference of my skills in comics. But, you know, everybody thinks that they want to, like, go and design, like, the next gem fusion or whatever, you know. Yeah. And it's like, design is incredible, but it's not always glamorous. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you get into it and you're like, oh, right, I have to draw a crowd mm -hmm. that looks good instead of, like, a blob. And as a board artist, I get to draw a blob, and <laughs> I think I prefer that. Anyway, yeah, I didn't, I didn't work in animation in Atlanta, but I am from Atlanta. Yeah, oh, that's really cool. I kind of want to ask a little bit to how how that process was like for you when you made the decision to really try to get into the industry. Like, did you have any like a like a specific strategy, or were you just kind of like going with the flow? What was it like when you really decided to try to get in the industry <clears throat> so it's funny i in preparation for the idea that i wanted to move to california i came to burbank for the first time for oh what's that called ctm mm. it was i think it was 2014 i'm a little iffy on the times i think it was 2014 it's my first time here and i was super nervous and i had my portfolio and i was walking around feeling really self-conscious but the more i showed my portfolio to people the more they knew who i was already oh that's so cool <laughs> and, yeah yeah which is like which is a nice ego boost sometimes it's kind of all you need but i kind of left that experience feeling like okay i can come here you know i can come here and i can be social and and i can put my face forward and uh that's ultimately what i did i decided 
that six months later I would move here and I came here and I had a lot of lunches mm. <laughs> and and I met a lot of really nice people and yeah I don't know it's it's not a very complicated story but yeah sorry I think I've gone off off the rails with the question no I think that's bit. really great because you're talking about getting lunches and would you get lunches with other peers like other artists or were you in contact with recruiters like who were you talking to both i remember having lunches with people i, I never went into lunches thinking oh this is going to be a job mm -hmm. like i always went into it knowing that in order to enjoy this is going to sound <laughs> two-faced but to enjoy success out here you have to be able to befriend people. And mm -hmm. I always went into it thinking these are people that I really respect and admire and I want to meet them and I want to pick their brains. <clears throat> and certainly there were lunches with recruiters as well. I was lucky to have a lot of contacts coming in from people who were already in the industry. But yeah, it was, it was as simple as like asking artists that I admired if they had, you know, if they had a, a spare hour mm -hmm. and learning a lot that way. It was always helpful. Nice. Would you go in the it, with like in the lunches with a lot of questions, like work related questions? Um. Yeah, I would. But I would say it was more important for me to get to know them as a person. To get to know the like, yeah, to get to know the them as a person and the human side of what they do. Mm. Um. I never wanted. I never went in wanting a specific answer or hoping for a specific answer. I to any questions I had. I I always. I always wanted to know how the job made them feel. Oh, that's and, great. Yeah, I wanted that. I wanted to know how the job made them feel. <clears throat> and I wanted to know how to best make myself useful on a job. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of usually where I focused my attention when I would when I would ask for advice. And I think that worked. I think that worked to my advantage. This this job this this line of work, it's very human. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going <laughs> to you're a creative person which means like you're always going to have to tap into your humanity to make that work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was always that was always my focus. That's great. That's a really I really love that answer and the way you spelled it out. I think mean, that's a great way also for to bring a little bit of an answer of like how to network, right? Because it's always like so difficult to know how to do that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It is. I, I you know, and I have people now and particularly as I started getting into the industry who always seem so intent on like getting, getting the magic answers and, and sometimes being a little too eager to like get straight to talk about what I, what I do and not like who I am as a person. Mm. And I get it. Like we're all, you know, hungry and eager and that's fine. But, but I always respond better when somebody like talks to me about, the the human side of what I do and I try to do the same when I talk to other people so yeah yeah just just tap into your own humanity because it will always serve you it'll always serve you well that's great I don't I don't know what this like Pearl Mario situation is <laughs> but this is what I'm doing I love it <laughs> he's he's beautiful he really is man I like that is actually a great design. <laughs> I'm like he looks so he looks so angry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm struggling so hard to kind of like draw like some of these props this morning for some reason. I'm like trying to draw this like pearl splatoon, and I've never played the game, so I'm like, you know what? I'll just try to see what I can do with a reference. <laughs> I think you're doing great, honestly. I think it's great. Oh, thank you. I kind of wanted to keep digging a little bit into that theme. Uh, and I'm going to give a quick shout out from to Lourdes Marshall on YouTube, who sure. asks, how difficult was it to get in the industry as a beginner artist? Like, so how would you gauge how hard it was to get in? Um, you know, I, I sort of got lucky, which I think I bet is something your a lot of your guests say. Mm -hmm. Because everybody's story is different. I think... For me, ultimately, none of those lunches are what provided me, quote unquote, provided me with a job. I had already been in touch with Kyle Carroza, who mm. created Mighty Magiswords, and he had expressed interest in me when I when I mentioned I was moving to L.A. And we I mean, we did have a lunch. So I guess I guess I just lied to you on accident. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's just me trying to, like, make my presence known. Like, I'm here. Yeah. Let's grab food. But um, 
I it took me about four months, and that's just because he was waiting for a while for an answer from from Cartoon Network about mm -hmm. whether or not he had a show, and so my situation is 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 a little different, and it'll it'll be different for everybody. I like to just kind of get in the nitty gritty of the details of like how how the first your first job in the industry happened. So it sounds like it was on oh, sure. uh, Mighty Mighty Swords, right? Yeah, yeah, it was, and I and and I think. It was just one of those things where making comics was the reason why I was able to make a case for myself as a board artist. Nice. And and I went straight into boarding. I didn't I didn't do any revisions. I I didn't start as a revisionist, which I do think was a mistake. Oh yeah, why? <laughs> yeah, I I well, I was very green. I really I I I learned or I sort of I picked up a lot of bad habits by kind of learning by doing without like some of the guidance that I think mm. revisions would have helped me learn. And I took a long time to break those habits. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah Cause it sounded like, can you tell us a little bit about the Magi Magisword production? Cause it, it, from what I've heard, it sounded like it was pretty, um, pretty loose in terms of like boards. Would you say that? Yeah, it was. We were working with outlines, but we were free to, rewrite them as needed and they were pretty loose anyway <laughs> you know and we had a we had a lot of content but very little time to make it happen mm -hmm. so it was kind of just like it was a little stressful we most of us were pretty new mm -hmm. and so we were all sort of boarding two episodes worth of of, of material for every one episode uh, and we just see a lot get cut it was it was loose but hectic at the same time if that makes sense yeah because it was it was for a lot of people it was everybody's first time right like it was Kyle's yeah. first time show running and it was like uh for a lot of people it was like their first boarding job would you say so you yeah, were all kind absolutely. of like figuring it out together yeah not all of us but most of us it was our first boarding job and it was Kyle's first time running a show mm. um you know he had had experience elsewhere before but uh but not as a showrunner and that job is really hard yeah mm -hmm. you know i certainly like i try to give people generally the benefit of the doubt now i i wasn't as good about that back then but i think i try to have sympathy for the fact that everybody's job is really hard yeah that's so true um, i feel like yeah. every step of the production and it's like you never really understand the full scope of a position until you step in it uh <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was it was a strange one to learn to learn how to how to do the job. It was a strange one because it was just we were making it in ways that you don't really see a lot. A lot of it was I mean, I was I was there it, it initially started as a as a series of shorts which were all animated in house. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. And we still had our animation team from what I remember. I hope this is true. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's true. We still had our animation team in house working on a lot of stuff. I think they were doing a lot of retakes. Mm. They were probably just straight up doing a lot of the like a lot of the more important shots and stuff. Mm. I I maybe don't quote me on that, but I I feel like that was the situation. But yeah, we were we were just unlike anything else that was being made at, at Cartoon Network and we were an interactive show. We were initially sort of a an online thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't know. It was just like it was just very different. It was very different. It was it was a very unusual tone. It was very different from everything Cartoon Network was producing at the time. They were doing a lot of like Steven Universe, eventually Craig of the Creek, mm -hmm. a regular a regular show. Uh, we were we were Looney Tunes meets anime. It was, <laughs> you know, it was just. What? It was it was a lot to adjust to. I I think fondly of that time. I do. Uh, but yeah, it was it was it was an uphill battle for a lot of us. We were all learning on the spot. It was tricky. Yeah, I, and especially because what you're talking about, like Looney Tunes anime, I feel like is something that is very appealing, especially like that's that's the kind of like blend that I feel does super well online. But it is hard yeah. to describe and to kind of have a full crew fit into. I think it's just such a specific blend of styles. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I... I think um again this is this is a charitable take like or not even charitable this this is coming from kindness this is not this is not a read this is not a criticism but I think with a lot of showrunners and this has been true of almost every job I've worked sometimes the vision is very clear in their head and you know communication skills can be all over the place but regardless of that it can be really hard 
to to guide the people who are helping you make the thing to do it in the way that you see mm-hmm. it you know and 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 Kyle he's that kind of guy who can just like you know just bang out a drawing of what he wants what he sees and it looks exactly how he wants it to look and and I really respect that but you know we were all sort of learning mm-hmm. to fit to that to some degree i mean we were it was a it was a flash show so we we did have some some leeway in terms of like some wiggle room in terms of being on model but we still wanted to like match the the energy of it and mm-hmm. i think we did a pretty good job yeah yeah mm-hmm. but yeah like that that mixture of those those two sort of very different styles and feelings and tones it was it was there was an adjustment period for sure yeah 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 that's so <laughs> yeah, that's really yeah. fun so how long were you on the show total um, I was on the show for its whole run as a series, so that was oh, I I boarded on it for about two, two years, years. I think we were, yeah, we were two seasons, and I think yeah, I think that was about two years. That yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, man. Back in the days when we had a job for two years. <laughs> I know I haven't had a job that long since that job, oh, which is really unfortunate. That's so crazy. Yes, yeah, crazy when we think yeah. about it, because that was not that long ago. Like, when was uh, what year were you on Magic Sword? Was it like? Let's see. I've been here for eight. Uh, I've been here almost nine years. Mm-hmm. It'll be nine years in June. <clears throat> Let's see. That was 2015, I think. Yeah. When I started, yeah, which is wild to think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny because we yeah. got in LA approximately at the same time. I got here in twenty six. 2016 yeah yeah so okay I yeah the show was uh in production do you so when magic sword wrapped up can you talk a little bit about like what that was like emotionally but also like finding a new job and all of that <laughs> yeah one of the things that i loved so much about working in studio which is a little harder to come by now is that I always had the opportunity to talk to people in other productions and not just my own. And so I always, I I, I had a lot of friends in other shows, on other shows, and I made sure to go and say hi when we had time and get cereal from the cereal bar or whatever, (laughs) (laughs) or candy from the candy Mm -hmm. machine. So really healthy. Uh, (laughs) And hang out. and, And I actually ended up sort of, making my case for a job on Craig of the Creek for a little bit after Magiswords. I was boarding on the finale for Magiswords at the same time as I was doing the sort of rough pass for my first Craig episode. And I was technically considered freelance, but yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I networked a lot. I was, I'm, it's weird at home, outside of work, I'm kind of a homebody. I'm kind of, you know, quiet and to myself, but but at work I come alive. And so, yeah, I just, you know, made sure I got in front of the right people and had meetings and made a good impression. And I, you know, this is back when testing was a lot more common. Mm -hmm. So I, I did a really good test for Craig and they, they wanted me to, to come on for a couple episodes. So I didn't, there wasn't a break between Magiswords and, and Craig for me, but it definitely was sad. You know, whenever, when anytime, anytime you finish and you've been, basically a family on some mm-hmm. level i mean i hate that term because it implies that we should you know kill ourselves to to make the job or overwork ourselves to make the job mm-hmm. work i should say but you know you're you're really close with your crewmates it's it's always sad it's it, even even if it's just like a a few months it's there's always that little empty feeling inside yeah 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 it was it was sad i remember going into my my office that i shared with with Zoe Moss, who was my board partner for a good portion of the show, and and it just smelled like hot plastic because the sun had been baking this nearly empty office, but I had to get something from it, and I was like, "Well, this is it." <laughs> yeah, it's just a weird, just a weird little moment. Although I'm a few parts melancholy sometimes, so I just sort of like to bask in that that feeling of like it's over. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I know what you're you mean. It's like kind of appreciating the emotion even if it's not like a completely positive emotion it's like yeah yeah. like if it's not a little bit sad was it worth it yeah 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 yeah. (laughs) (laughs) i don't know if that's healthy but that is how i feel at the end of most jobs there are some jobs where i was happy to finish up and be done but but yeah like i will always have love for my time at magiswords even though it was it was pretty pretty hectic sometimes 
it was my first job in the industry and it was I got to work at Cartoon Network and that's where I really wanted to work. I got I got very lucky. Yeah, that's really Yeah. I I yeah, that's a great that's a great story because I feel like the first jobs are always so special because you're learning so much. I feel like there's so much <laughs> you learn and you you yeah. you keep learning in the in, in the next jobs, but I feel like the, the first job is the one where you really just like have to hit the ground running and <laughs> and just learn everything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It sort of feels that way with every job because you are like you're readjusting everything about yourself creatively to fit yes. for this new job. But absolutely, it's there's an excitement that you can't reproduce when you're just learning everything, when it's all new and when it's like Cartoon Network has a pancake machine. Like that's exciting at first. Yeah. But then after your after your hundredth pancake, you're like, it's a pretty good pancake for something that's made by a metal box with a conveyor belt in it. Yeah. Like, you know, but when it's exciting, when it's new, it's great. Yeah. I miss the pancake machine. That's so funny. Yeah. It's I don't know if they still have it anymore because that building is not theirs anymore now. It's all in the Correct. same one building. But yeah. um Yeah, I um I I don't know what they did with the pancake machine. I have a feeling they probably sold it or trashed it. But Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I've... It's probably better that I didn't try to buy it. <laughs> I kind of want to get into this question from someone on Instagram, Ask Paint Sponges. What is your favorite thing about being a storyboard artist? And what's something unexpected you learned after you first started getting work as a board artist? My favorite thing is feeling like I have, feeling like I have a real influence on the finished product. Mm. Uh, feeling like I, especially, I mean, I, <laughs> there's a, there's board driven and there's script driven I prefer script driven now because mm -hmm. I board driven is a lot of work. We have to write it as well. Um, and sometimes that's writing on the spot and that's really hard, but the ego does love the opportunity to really put your stamp on the, on the story in such a big way when it's like a board driven mm -hmm. when it's a board driven show. But yeah, I like to, I like the opportunity to really make a difference in terms of the actual story and feel like when I see the final thing, <clears throat> I'm really seeing myself on the screen, especially if it's, you know, like a more personal episode of something, something that feels like you're really personally invested in making sure it's great. So I love, I love that. I love, again, it's that human element. I love being able to add myself to something and thing I didn't expect. I mean, kind of everything it, it's, it, it always looks, it always looks so easy when you see other people do it. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but it's, yeah, but it's so hard. Like, People, nobody can draw for eight hours a day, five days a week, nonstop. Mm -hmm. If we could, we'd all be able to finish our board in two weeks or one week. But like, it's just a whole lot of starting and stopping. It's a whole lot of thinking <laughs> and toiling. And I guess I, I guess I didn't expect that. I, I've learned to accept it. That's okay. Sometimes it's not going to be easy. Rarely is it easy. But yeah, I guess I expected it to be a little more effortless. And I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, I think it's a. I think it's the thing that's a little bit deceiving when you see a, a storyboard online and you're like, oh well, these are rough drawings. This is really fast to draw, right? But then it's like there is just so many drawings, and you yeah. know, there's a lot of them, and there's more to it than just drawing. You know, like you, you know, even if you're doing a script driven show where you don't have to write it, you still have to think a lot about shot compositions and acting and expressions and just like making sure the you've laid down a grid that feels appropriate for a background artist to work from or mm -hmm. makes sense for the shot i don't know it's just there's so much to it it's it truly is like everything in the kitchen sink and that keeps it exciting but it can it can be really stressful not to discourage anybody i mean like when it's great it's great yeah yeah no but i think it's like i like that you're describing that all of these different skills all together amount to a lot of brain power because boards is, can look kind of deceivingly easy and and i like i don't know that's my little soapbox moment <laughs> people who listen to all the episodes in a row they know that i have my little <laughs> moment where i'm like boards are hard <laughs> but, but it's like but it's true yeah <laughs> Yeah. It's not, to, yeah, like you said, it's not to discourage anybody. It's just to kind of give ourselves a little pat on the back. <laughs> well, and the other thing that is difficult 
uh, that, that's a little misleading is that the boards that we see online are almost always we have like a confirmation bias because we're looking at boards from artists that we love, whose work we love, who are doing these sort of next level boards. Those are the likeliest ones to be shared as our best work. Yeah. But you know, not every, not every panel, not every shot is going to look great. Like not every, I mean, it's going to be functional. It's going to communicate, which is really, you know, the most important part, but like the prettiest stuff is what you see online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so I, I think I'm still in this, in this this mode where I, where I have to remind myself like not every drawing has to be pretty it's 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 not about that i guess that's something that i would say i learned and was really valuable and i'm still still working on cuz you know my boards are really clean mm -hmm. typically and i don't consider that a plus i think it's nice but it's like it takes so much longer yeah but yeah i don't know don't be don't be fooled by what you see online like Every every artist whose work you love, like they have ugly boards too. They just don't show them. Yeah, that's so true. There is a, a moment on a production when you're like, are on an episode and you're like, oh, this was actually a really cool episode. I'm just gonna give it a hundred percent, just because then I know I can kind of like use it for my portfolio. But yeah. that's just yeah, it's definitely not every episode. That's so yeah, that's a really interesting observation here. Do you feel like you you're really cleaning your boards because you? come from comics i think i'm really clean on my boards because i do a lot of illustration mm. and comics to some degree yeah but i don't know how to how to draw k rule i'm sorry gabe uh, <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going well <laughs> i know gabe he's he's he'll he'll be fine he'll be fine I'll with it. one later you I'll draw him a good one later. It's fine. You can look up references if you want. It doesn't have to. Oh, I am. That's the pro That's the problem. Is I'm looking at references, <laughs> and it's bad. I'm. It's not good. It's fine. I'll try again. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening on Spotify, anybody, make sure you check out the YouTube video so you could, and then you can comment if you like the song. No. <laughs> you, know, you can. I, you know, it's fine if you don't. Not every, again. Not every drawing is going to be. It's going to be great. What is what is the old Steven Universe saying? If I if I can be so glib, if every pork chop were perfect, we wouldn't have hot dogs. Ha ha. That's a, that's <laughs> that's really cute. Yeah, they yeah, have some, it is really. They cute. have some some really good lines in that they show. Did, yeah. <laughs> I kind of wanted to add. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned illustrations because I remember definitely feeling that way when I was mostly barding at the beginning of my career. I didn't really have a lot of time to work on personal stuff. And there was a moment when I was like, I feel like I'm never finishing any drawing and I feel like I'm never doing anything yeah. finished. And sometimes I feel like if you're someone who comes from more like comics or illustration that can start kind of like weighing on you a little bit, just cause it's like, I don't, I just want to see a finished drawing. I just want to make it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. It's always wild to me when I see artists who color their boards and stuff, but on some level I get it mm -hmm. because like or people even people who do a lot of like really fancy grayscale shading and stuff i understand that desire to see this thing feel finished mm -hmm. and it is finished it's finished when it's when it communicates what it needs to communicate right yeah but you know we're really we're really bad at knowing when that is <laughs> because we are all obsessed with making pretty things and i don't know it's okay if it's ugly I don't know. Not every board is going to look good. Not every board is going to look good, but yeah, because a good board, a, a good board will communicate. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you're you're building the blueprints for an episode, so you're not trying to finish the episode all by yourself. That's why there's like a whole team. Yeah, yeah. I like to consider a storyboard like a conversation with everybody that has to has to touch it after you, mm -hmm. and like. In my head, when I'm boarding, I think, well, what is this going to look like? Like, what is this? Oh, that's a good K roll. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's see, that's how you draw K roll. Yeah, what what is this going to look like to the people who need to use it for reference, for design, for backgrounds, for you know, for animation, for timing, for any of it? Like everything, everything is. It's a conversation, and I don't know. I, I when I think of it that way. I try to think like it's okay if this drawing is not great because the person who's going to be handling it for this purpose is 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 going to know what to do with it. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, so true. Yeah. And also because we have like so much to think about too when doing boards, where a lot of time we don't have designs 
for like pre-design when we start an episode. So we have to kind of like come up with with a rough layout for a lot of the backgrounds. We have to come up with a rough design for characters that haven't been designed. And so ideally we maybe i mean depending on the show like not giving too many details on that on that character kind of leaves a little bit of room for design to kind of like go nuts with it i guess yeah that's a really that's a really healthy healthy way to look at it i think sometimes in those situations we think oh how can i make this design really nice Mm -hmm. because i want to put my stamp on this part of the process but it's like you want it to be fun to draw you want it to be to look good and communicative but like ultimately it's the designer's job to to take that idea and turn it into something that really works for the show and it's not all about you and i i i don't know like that's that's the beauty of working on a team Mm -hmm. like it's not all about you (laughs) but you know artists are really bad at knowing that so (laughs) Yeah, and that's, it, and that's okay. I think that's part of that's also part of what you learn on the job. I feel like like learning soft skills and learning how to kind of integrate in a team and and how to communicate uh, efficiently too between with your supervisor and your peers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's you know what it's like any any good relationship. It's all about communication, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. So you've uh, you've worked on. So we were talking about how you worked on Craig of the Creek, and uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you we have a you worked on a, on a lot of shows. But we have somebody who asks. So Gerardo Peter asks, "I'd love to know what it was like working on Battle Kitty. Did the interactive nature of the series change the workflow or pipeline at all?" <clears throat> so. Yes, uh, I think it slowed us down a lot because we had to. I, I think. Hmm, how do I put this? I think there was a lot more red tape mm. <laughs> because because we had to think about the ways in which the show was interactive, and we were all boarding. I mean, there were the main episodes, and then there were shorts, and then there were like there were like really small shorts. So we were constantly sort of bouncing around what kinds of stories we were telling, and how long those stories were, and the schedule was a little uncomfortable for that reason Mm -hmm. just in terms of like you never really felt like you set into a rhythm Mm. but most of the interactive elements that was like a lot of that was kind of out of our hands as board artists we had we had to think about it on some level but it was really more that was that was kind of being wrangled by other people the map stuff was like it's incredible it's so cute Mm -hmm. but yeah the interactive elements they were kind of out of our hands we had to keep them in mind but they were they were not ultimately our responsibility. Uh, Matt Lazell was the the creator and showrunner on that, and he's another one of those people who like has an amazing idea in his head, and it's sometimes hard to match that. Mm-hmm. But I would say I learned a lot about being funny working on that show and working under him. But not only that, even though even though it was stressful because we were all making a lot of work in a short amount of time, I. I always really appreciated how graceful Matt was. He was always very kind and very understanding to the pressures of working on a really interesting new concept for uh you know for Netflix who wasn't who was only just starting to do in-house animated stuff at the time. So so yeah, I would say the biggest takeaway from that job was that I made some incredible friends and we made an incredible show and I learned a lot about about empathy mm-hmm. and i consider it an extremely valuable experience and i think it's the funniest thing i've ever gotten to work on it's great yeah and it looks so good and was it your first show working in the cg yeah but you know we boarded it like a 2d show nice yeah it was it was i don't i don't really know a lot about boarding specifically for 3d for for cg uh we boarded it very much like i would board anything else oh interesting you didn't have like any kind of like specific roles that were like specific to cg i know like usually some of the stuff they're like oh avoid characters touching each other because it's really hard to animate (laughs) like stuff like that we yeah yeah we definitely had rules about about you know yeah like characters interacting with each other in certain ways and how we would have the characters emote and express because the models they're meant to look sort of rigid and toy like mm-hmm. there were certainly rules but any show any show has rules that you kind of have to to stick to when drawing it but yeah there were no like i mean we had to be 
we we had a little more freedom with camera movements and stuff but i've never been a big fan of like big fancy camera movements so mm-hmm. i would consider that something i <laughs> something i wish i had taken advantage of a little more on the show was being a little more brave with that but um mm-hmm. but yeah it was very much like boarding anything in 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 2D it was it was shockingly close <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. So in terms of timeline, I know we're jumping around a little bit here, but uh, You're fine. you you also worked on the Steven Universe. I did. I worked on Future, the final season. Mm, was that after or before Battle Kitty? That was before. I worked on Magiswords and then Craig for two, two episodes mm-hmm. or one or two episodes. I can't remember. Two. It was two episodes. And then I jumped over to Steven for six months for Future and jumped back to Craig for one or two episodes more and then then to battle kitty oh wow yeah so you yeah you were at you were at cartoon network a bunch uh before you moved to netflix yeah 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 netflix was my second studio oh wow puzzled one from patreon is asking if you learned anything in particular from working on steven universe that you think has made you a better artist and writer yeah steven universe was you know how like growing up you have desires to work on specific things or to make specific things that you love Mm -hmm. that you're a fan of and i've never really been that person but steven universe was my it was my spider-man you Mm -hmm. know it was my thing that i wanted to make and i'm really glad i got to do it i learned a lot about balancing mental health with work on that show because i was I was unmedicated Mm -hmm. for my anxiety at the time, if I remember correctly, and I was just not ready for that job. Mm. I was too green. Uh, I was working with, and I, and I value that experience. I really do. I love that I got to do it. I love some of the work I did. I would go back and do that job if I could. That's the only one I would go back and do. (laughs) But I, I learned a lot about advocating for yourself. I learned a lot about balancing your self with the job Mm -hmm. i yeah it was it was i learned a lot of personal things doing that job that's i don't know i don't want to sound negative it was like a really formative experience for me but uh it just was one that i wasn't quite ready for you know and i I don't know. I mean, I also, I will say, like, from a practical perspective, I learned a lot from the supervisors and directors about how to be a better board artist. Mm -hmm. These are things that I wish I had known going into the job. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can't change that. So Yeah, and I feel like uh, Steven was, like, a very hard show to work on from whatever, not in a negative way, but it's just, like, you needed, like, like, it's, like, a show that asks for a lot of skills. Like, not only did you need to be, like, a right, like, a good writer, but you need to, like know all the storyboarding and i think that experience of kind of like working on future which was a pretty new crew compared to the very original seasons uh yeah. had like a lot of people who were really like excited to work on their favorite ip and i think that that yeah. can be kind of tough because it's kind of hard to find the boundary between like yourself and the work yeah it's a lot of pressure when you feel like when you're part of making something good that you have always felt was incredible and you don't know if you can match that level and and that's that's just too much pressure to put on yourself Mm -hmm. you know uh nobody nobody should feel that way about (laughs) about the things they do you know about their job about anything really (laughs) i don't know like yeah it's it it was a lesson in being kind to myself Mm -hmm. accepting that like sometimes you can love something too much like yeah. it's really complicated right mm-hmm. uh, again i i have uh, many positive feelings about my experience on steven i'm not here to to make it sound like it was a bad time it was just a very you know it's just very tricky and and a lot of us cared a lot maybe a little too much mm-hmm. yeah yeah i know t- i totally relate to that i feel like there's a moment when because the thing is that like you're you're quote unquote just a board artist so there are moments when some of the decision making it anyhow is gonna be made up top so y- you don't have you have control but you don't have like either like a hundred percent control so it's like 
sometimes it's good to kind of like step back a little bit just to give back that control to like supervisors or other team members i guess if that yeah make any sense for anybody listening (laughs) yeah i mean it certainly makes sense for me that is definitely something i learned as well is like uh, you know so i would say largely because of steven universe a lot of younger board artists at the time including myself younger slash newer went into the job of boarding thinking like oh i'm a hot shot like i you know i'm a board artist board artists are like online they're internet famous on tumblr (laughs) (laughs) yeah we all go go into that with that mindset but like once you're there and this was true on magic swords this was true on, on craig but like you have influence on the thing but again you're you're part of the process you're not the process and there were times on steven where like ideas i mean um, rebecca to her credit has always been really uh, she was amazing to work with Mm -hmm. she loves hearing everybody's perspective and i think that's really cool but at the end of the day you have to learn to hear no yeah like Mm -hmm. you just have to learn like hey your idea it's not it's maybe not that your idea is bad sometimes your idea is bad (laughs) but (laughs) You have to you have to learn to say no. Um, it's it's throwing eggs at a wall. Like you're, it's good to get the ideas out, but it's it's good to hear no. <laughs> it's good to it's good to know when when no is good. Yeah, and it's also kind of like that thing that's a little tricky too when you're working on a board driven show versus a versus a script driven show is that like on a board driven show you're a little bit like in a writer's room and and that's like a whole new set of skills that you need to learn in terms of like knowing when to pick up what the showrunner and or like head of story is asking for in terms of like sometimes it can be kind of subtle but like you said like if you're like pitch an (laughs) idea once or twice and they're like "Mm, that's interesting but um you know and it's like oh okay that means no (laughs) yeah absolutely i i mean to to the credit of of the you know the higher up positions the the higher up creatives on Steven they were always pretty good about being able to say this doesn't work this isn't what we need mm-hmm. and i you know it, there were times where it was really hard to hear especially if you put a lot of a lot of effort into an idea but yeah i mean it's the right thing <laughs> most of the time i felt like in, in, looking back i was like okay they were right that's fine yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, you know, like this job, for anybody that's looking to get into storyboarding, I'm not going to sit here and be like, I'm an old millennial and you have to have a, a thick skin. It's not that. It's it's more that you have to, like, appreciate that as part of the process, taking notes and taking feedback, it's not personal and it's healthy. And sometimes it is hard. It's still hard. Even eight years in, it's hard. But, like... It's also nice to know that the fact that they're giving you notes means you're not alone. Yeah. <laughs> you, have, you know, if if you have people in leadership positions who are who who are good at what they're doing, they will they will know that you are doing your best. Yeah. And they will be cognizant and empathetic and sympathetic to that. Mm-hmm. I've I've definitely worked with some people who who I think just really enjoyed being right. But mm-hmm. but a good but a good director or supervisor uh knows that you're that you're trying your hardest and is patient with you and is there to help you. And getting notes, it's hard, but but it is good for you. And that's a big part of the job. Yeah, and it's also like a way to show that they care. I feel like there's always a moment like if you stop getting notes, it's kinda like oops. You know, it's kind of, it, it, yeah. it might be like a scary <laughs> indicator. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely tell, like, sometimes you didn't get a lot of notes because you really knocked it out, knocked it out of the park. And sometimes you didn't get a lot of notes because they're just like, I don't know what to do with this, man. <laughs> <laughs> and we've all been there. It's okay. But yeah, it's it's definitely, it's a thing that you kind of know in the room. <laughs> yeah that, that i feel like that, yeah yeah yeah. that's so like it's funny because it's we could talk about it but then at, at the end of the day i feel like you kind of have to experience it to kind of really like understand like the depth of it at least for me that's kind of how i felt like going coming here in in the u.s and experiencing the way the productions work is kind of like oh you do kind of have to like go through the ringer a couple of times to be like oh okay that's what this means or this is kind of yeah. <laughs> how this works <laughs> 
yeah, you know, it's 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 broken eggs making an omelet. Like your first episode, maybe your first two, they're always going to be a little weird and wonky because you're learning how to make a show. Like uh, it, it, the if the people in charge are not are not empathetic and sympathetic to that, that is a failing on their part. But you're gonna you're gonna break some eggs. It's it's okay. And you and and and, and, and like any skill, learning to take to take notes and to take critiques it just it just takes time and you just have to hear it a lot yeah that's true too the the hearing it a lot part is like sometimes yeah. we're like i've mastered <laughs> this and then that's like oh maybe not <laughs> yeah i mean there are times in in life where or in in work where you're just like i can't get this note anymore but it's like you know sometimes you just need to realize why you keep getting that note like sometimes it's just something you need to think about but I don't know. We're all doing our best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of awesome questions too that are, I'm going to try to kind of lump them into like a similar type of theme. And I think mm. we're going to go into your prime time, more kind of like realm of experience sure. with at Chavistian one. Uh, who mm-hmm. asked, what is the experience like coming from kids animation to adult primetime animation in terms of boarding, writing, and dealing with SNP notes? People love the SNP <laughs> stories. <laughs> I think I think because people are afraid of getting those notes. <laughs> and they and they can be really frustrating. My experience in in kids media is that you do have a, a lot more influence on the final thing. In my experience, this isn't necessarily true across the board, but adult prime time tends to be a little more writer driven. Mm-hmm. That's different from script driven. It's it's where the or I guess it's it's script driven, but you know, typically in my experience, it's a lot more sort of driven completely by what the writers want and and put on the page, and you can't really change it. A lot of the time, you're even working with stuff that's already been recorded by actors. Oh yeah, that's true. Uh, that's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, that's not as common with kids media. So yeah, I found I, I have found that working in a, adult prime time, it's more like just doing the job and trying to do it well, and less about making a lot of really deep creative decisions. And there's nothing there's nothing wrong with just wanting to do the job and do it well. Mm-hmm. My Isabel's looking a little goofy here. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try her again. Um, it's just it's it's and I don't think it's a bad thing. I, I think it's just kind of putting your head down and taking notes and not pushing back too much because there's not a lot of wiggle room. It really is about what's already on the page. And do I prefer it? No, <laughs> I don't. But I'm. Mm-hmm. I, but it's a job, and it, and and sometimes I sometimes what I need is a job that's a job mm-hmm. and not this big grand creative thing. Um, sometimes that's just what life calls for. Yeah, and I think that can also be very useful between balancing personal and professional art, like at least, Mm -hmm. like from my experience, I feel like when you can take a little bit of a step back from the day job, because there's like a lot of stuff that's been figured out for you in terms of like style and, uh, and story and all that, then you have a little bit more brain space and... I think that's kind of like a, a good way to jump into your personal art. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Ninja Panda thirty nine three is asking, "What are your favorite things to design?" So I'm going to ask specifically for your personal art. Sure. So anybody who's aware of me knows that most of my personal art is pinups of men with larger bodies, which is a very sort of dry way to put it. <laughs> but I love the human form of all genders but i like specifically focus on male bodies i am a queer person i feel like more art with that expresses queer joy is is something that i think we all kind of need right now as queer people in a very divisive world and that's something that i like to contribute to i also just love things that are campy i love anything with like a wink and a nod Mm -hmm. and it's Really, I, I think also it's wildly different from what I would draw if I'm working in kids' media. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's easy to separate that from from work work. And yeah, that's, I don't know. I just love the human form. I, I, I think we're really beautiful machines <laughs> yeah that's so yeah and i think like and you have like a like a very cute way to to like do your your drawings they're like they're both 
anatomically correct but also very <laughs> cute uh, you have like a very like kind of round type of design which is really pleasing to love oh thank you <laughs> and i was I think we had a question. Yeah, like, uh, so I can kind of jump into Steph Statics Art on Instagram is asking, like, what was your process for developing your style and what influences led you to the current look and feel of your work? Sure. I would say my biggest influence has to be all of those video game manuals I copied from as a kid. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm blanking on the artist's name right now, but if you look at the old Super Mario Brothers artwork, it doesn't look like anything out there. It's these perfectly clean lines and these like beautiful airbrush highlights and it's still unmatched. And they still have that style as like one of their sort of house styles over at Nintendo for, for Mario and Donkey Kong and Yoshi related things. <clears throat> and I just love I just love a big, fat, bold line and <laughs> and I, I guess I've loved that ever since I was a kid. So yeah, I love I love that. I love. I'm. 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 I'm a little anime deficient, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But I. But I do. I do love the style of like 80s and 90s anime as like a, a stylistic influence. It's something that I need to actually get more familiar with, so that I can talk to more of my friends about stuff for a change. <laughs> because everybody knows so much about anime, and I'm like, I get the basic references, but I lack the nuance. So yeah, I just love any anything that feels bold and bright I, I love you know clean lines and you know working in animation for so long i mean it, it uh, in, in animation and comics i don't know i i've always just favored designs that are easier and more manageable and uh, my stuff maybe it doesn't look very hard to draw because i like to keep it simple. Yeah, I don't know. Simplicity. I love simplicity. So learning through the years doing storyboards and working in animation and appreciating cartoons, I've learned a lot about how I can cut corners without sacrificing quality. Yeah, I would say my professional work is a big influence on my personal work in that way. Oh, yeah. Always thinking about ways I can make it feel streamlined. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I felt a little bit like almost like there's a, like a little brush of like anime influence in your work but now that you mentioned the nintendo i'm like oh that's what it is yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean what is nintendo but anime right? right 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 like just a different one than what what i think like most than what your mom thinks of when she thinks of anime yeah. like you know but yeah i just love <laughs> cute things and nintendo has always been really good at that and yeah i'd say that's like uh, Nintendo as an extension of anime yeah. is like kind yes. of kind of my influence or you know Doraemon mm -hmm. Astro Boy slash Mighty Adam like those are two perfect designs in my opinion like yeah I just love cute and simple stuff and stuff that's bright and poppy and colorful and it's funny as a teenager I was like all about Invader Zim and I wanted so bad to be goth but I wasn't cool enough <laughs> and then I just accepted that I'm like I'm gay and also I love bright colors and, and it changed my life so yeah. that's so funny because I kind of like relate to to that in the sense of like being like wanting to be like cool so bad because there was there's a little bit of like the invaders um, kind of vibe that is kind of very cool and edgy uh-huh and then you have to come to terms like maybe I'm not edgy Maybe I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you think know? when you're a teenager, I think you miss out on the things that make Invader Zim smart, and you focus instead on the things that make it really quotable and memeable. And like you're when you want to feel bad because it's fun to feel bad when you're a teenager on some level. Mm -hmm. Like when you want to be edgy and moody, like it's it's easy to latch on to those aspects of that show but i still think there's a lot of value in invader zim uh, not that we're saying there isn't i mean i think there's a lot of value in goth culture yeah. too like not i don't want to devalue anybody's anybody's you know oh i, thing, I still love but... emo and goth culture so much like yeah <laughs> i i it's it's a weird thing because i feel like I, i've never been like a hundred percent in it but i was kind of like adjacent to it and they're definitely right. my favorite characters to design i still love nowadays to like look up goth fashion or like emo and scene fashion it's like i don't know because <laughs> for some reason like the big hair it kind of reminds me a little bit of like j-rock or like like absolutely you know 
<laughs> like if you like played Final Fantasy, you're probably really into scene uh, as well. I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, also, this has always been true where there's where there's goth kids, there's probably anime. Yeah. <laughs> like if, if you were friends with the anime girls or the goth kids, like if you were friends with the nerdy girls in high school mm. or the goth kids, they were all watching anime. They were all playing video games like goth kids are just nerds that are too cool to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I say that lovingly. I wanted so badly to be that cool, but instead I was just a nerd. <laughs> and that's okay. I turned out okay. <laughs> but yeah, those things have always kind of existed together. And I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It is both very campy, though. I feel like, like, I think that <laughs> all gravitates around camp, right? Like, yeah. the, like the nerd culture, goth, anime, all of that. It's very, yeah. um... I don't know exactly like in the week how like dramatic like dramatic <laughs> <laughs> yeah it takes a lot of self-awareness to pull any of any of that off correctly mm -hmm. like the ways that the ways that golf culture is funny the way anytime anybody's funny it's usually it's usually a self-aware thing I don't know I I think I think it's all really funny is what I'm trying to say yeah 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah but it all feels related it all feels like none of it exists without without each other goth culture and anime mm -hmm. anime nerds it's great it's beautiful <laughs> now i want to like make a goth pinup i've never really done that yeah i was just thinking about it oh, <laughs> you've inspired yeah me. <laughs> i'm like oh i can't wait to see to see it uh, you have to sketch it on the show <laughs> oh my gosh it happened here mm. first everybody the inception <laughs> of the goth pinup <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Let me think. Well, I've got my beautiful Isabel. Yeah, that's a great. She's, she's so cute. That's like like the perfect. I was trying to do that, the like Animal Crossing and like <laughs> Sailor Scout, and I was like, I I I can't figure it out. And this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great prompt. It's really good. Yeah. I think I gave her a foxtail, but you know what? When she's Sailor Moon, she can be a fox dog. <laughs> what are foxes but cats and dogs that have become one? Right. Um, oh, they're so yeah. cute. I recently well. Uh, as a, you know, when you're like trying to like react to someone's comment with a GIF, you go into the little like Giphy, and I was I typed in Zoomies and like a GIF <laughs> of a Fennec <laughs> popped up, and I was like, oh, oh, that is like the perfect some <laughs> symbiosis between a cat and a dog, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it really is, yeah. They're like small <laughs> cat-like personality, but also they're like a little dog. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, they'll eat other animals, but also they they make cute noises, and I'm here for it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I realize that we have some other, like, really great questions about, like, so working on shows, so we're going to, like, hop back into um, the animation industry conversation with this Twitter question from sure. at Eggwords, who asks, is it harder to board on a new show or one that's already been established when you join? That's a really good question. I kind of feel like they both have their their ups and downs. I actually really prefer to work on a new show because it's again it's that thing of feeling like you're contributing to the the tone and the direction of of something whereas like coming in on a show that's really established. I mean if it's if it's one season in it's a little easier because you feel like they've worked out a lot of the kinks. Mm -hmm. But if it's, you know, in the case of Steven, I think we were on, I think Future was technically like season six. You're coming in and you're joining a group of, pe group of people who are speaking a whole different language and you have to learn it on the spot. So if it's if it's like a long running series, and, and I haven't jumped into too many of those, but if it is, that comes with some really unique challenges. I think I I personally prefer coming in on something something new, though, or something that's one season in. Yeah, because then you get to, like, figure it out with the rest of the crew. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It is a little daunting to, like, think about coming onto a show that's, like, in season, like, five or six. Like, for example, I don't know if you, like, were to jump onto, like, Rick and Morty and you're, like, ooh. It's, like, kind of already, like, got so many seasons and you have to, like, learn the style <laughs> of the show. Yeah. And, you know, like, usually the reason that you are there is because you're... You, you proved on some level that you're able to to fit in with that mm. but it is you know it's challenging no matter no matter what um we have some questions about 
your favorite so joe benson our patron is asking what is your favorite a24 movie besides the series you've worked on (laughs) (laughs) first of all number one happy family usa the series that i worked on it's a really it's a really unique project it it's it's really funny look forward to it i don't want to say too much because i don't know how much i can or should say but uh it's cool (laughs) after giving it some thought (laughs) i think everything everywhere all at once is one of the best movies i've seen in the past decade and it's such an easy answer like everybody loves that movie it's so clever it's so it's so it's got that that amazing action but it's also got that incredible human element it's also really campy but Mm -hmm. in the best way I also really like Midsommar, or Midsummer, however you want to pronounce it. I don't think it's a perfect movie, but I think it's a really interesting one. And sometimes that's better than... I think that's better than perfect. Mm. And it's hard to watch. Like, when I first saw it, I, I think we I think we double featured that and whatever Spider-Man movie came out at the time. And I remember watching... I think we watched it after Spider-Man, maybe before. But I remember afterwards, my eyes felt deep fried. It's such a bright movie. Oh, Midsommar? Like, it just... Yeah, yeah, it's so bright. That's true. I forgot. I watched it on TV, so I I don't have like the movie experience. <laughs> but uh, yeah, because of yeah, yeah, because of like the the trippy sequences and stuff. Yeah, it's just it all takes place in you know a place where there's not really nighttime, and so yeah, you're if you see it in theaters, your eyes are just like, what have you done to me for the past two and a half hours? <laughs> it's it's rough, but it is really it's a good movie. I think it's good in so many ways it's a really interesting take on horror Mm -hmm. and i mean i'm sure a lot of people have seen it but if you haven't and if you have the stomach for you know weird uh, swedish death cults in the daylight there's your movie there's your movie (laughs) yeah there's there's your saturday night (laughs) yeah i i wonder which one i like left more of an impression on me if it was is it the same guy who did the witch no um no no uh he did her he did her editary yeah because and Bo is afraid yeah oh that's him too okay i didn't need to watch Bo is afraid i i i did really like hereditary i i I don't know if i like midsummer hereditary more i feel like Mm, i like that there's the family element in hereditary right right yeah midsummer is more it's a breakup story Mm -hmm. but not a very happy one but if you'll believe it i've never seen hereditary and i need to watch it yeah, it's also kind of, it's it's yeah. also freaky, but I I think I also liked it because there's a little bit less of the very like kind of like gruesome Im- imagery. Like I mean, it's still there's still some pretty gruesome stuff, but it's for me, I don't know, the people jumping off the cliff and like, you know, <laughs> like yeah. having the whole thing of that that was uh, that's very I mean, I know that's what they were going for. They want you to feel queasy yeah. and and like <laughs> yikes. <laughs> But yeah. it is also it, it, very hard to watch. Yeah, I mean, hey, it worked. <laughs> it worked, uh, exactly. But, but I agree with you. It is hard to watch. And there are, there are moments in that film where I'm just like, make sure you didn't eat recently. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's yucky. But it's smart. It's a smart movie. And Florence Pugh, I mean, come on. None of us can compare to Florence Pugh. She's amazing. Mm. <laughs> I think we have some like fun little questions. Like I'll just give a quick shout out to uh well I guess we already answered a question from Nuff like Casey L5734. Thank you for all your other questions. But I wanna get to at Zinth Stars on YouTube who asked, Do you prefer communicating stories visually or through writing? Visually. I find it really, really hard to send just a written thing to somebody because I I feel like <laughs> visually uh, uh, so okay I'm not I'm not good at brevity I'm really wordy and one of the things I like about communi- communicating with art and with with visual art I should say is that I get to say a lot in a shorter in what feels like a shorter space um whereas if I'm writing something I'm going to tell you every stupid detail mm-hmm things you don't even need to know and i just feel like i'm wasting my time if i'm just sending somebody a written thing i i I can write a script or a comic script cartoon or comic script in a way that communicates well to other people but in general if i have the time and the energy to to put at least some visual element on there just to make sure we're like meeting in the same place i will that's what i prefer to do yeah i feel that i feel like i don't know if you if you also relate to this, but I feel like sometimes just drawing a scene 
is or even just a picture tells so much more than what we could do with words i don't know i feel like prose is so hard like i've tr i've tried to write prose and i'm like i don't know this is like you know there's like <laughs> such a specific way of layering elements to translate a feeling or like an atmosphere without being too verbose right yeah i agree there's just so much going on in our heads you know it's nice to be able to say here's here's the thing mm -hmm. whereas writing it to me writing always in my process always feels like a blueprint it always feels like a plan mm -hmm. and of course like visual things can be plans too but i just i don't know i like i like not wasting people's time <laughs> and i feel like my writing wa wastes people's time <laughs> that's funny maybe i should appreciate my writing skills a little more i don't know <laughs> There's something that we were talking prior to recording that I kind of want to get into a little bit where sure. we were talking a little bit about how, yeah, like because of your, the nature of your personal art, which can be kind of intimate, the, the people can feel like they can be sort of to kind of skip a, a boundary line maybe with you as an artist. And how do you kind of handle that? I might have said this previously while recording But I I do try to give people the benefit of the doubt. I think most people mean well. Mm -hmm. If people cross a certain boundary, I'm happy to use the block button, mm -hmm. <laughs> which I think is something being creatives online that share our work, regardless of the content of it, we should all be comfortable with the block button. Mm -hmm. But it is tough because... So just to get personal for a second, mm -hmm. my boyfriend and I, we're, we're in an open relationship. Mm -hmm. So we have boundaries, we have we have rules about that, but there's some openness in like how how we interact with other people in a in a flirty or potentially sexual way. Mm -hmm. And so I think some people who who know that think that it's okay to cross the boundaries even further than they should. And I guess I would say the best thing you can do in any situation is always always do your due diligence to to get a feel for how somebody feels about you or how a question sounds mm. it's tough it's it's i understand on some level why people feel like they feel like they they can cross that boundary i understand how sometimes people may think that my work is consent but my work is not consent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my words and my actions are when i'm interacting with you individually but but my work is not mm -hmm. that said like if people are just like giving a compliment to me or whatever like i'm used to it it's fine i'm not gonna sit here and tell you like i'm 10 out of 10 hot mama or whatever but like <laughs> i appreciate a compliment i'm human it's fine mm -hmm. but you know when people get creepy or weird you know that's when i i'm likelier to use the block button than say something these days because i i don't like arguing with people on the internet or making things weird mm -hmm. <laughs> but but yeah i just use the block button if you need to <laughs> no, I like to talk about those kind of stuff because I do feel like as artists, we we have to kind of have a little bit of a, a public facing persona just to share our art. And even like, even if, even as an artist, if you want to do commissions, it's almost impossible if you don't have like an internet presence and you, and you want to kind of show the kind of work that you would want to be commissioned for. And I think that those are kind of really interesting things to think about about how you can manage your community i guess <laughs> yeah well and, and it's it's really tough because for a very long time for you know 15 years now as denizens of the internet we've all sort of accepted that in order to be successful you also have to be a person mm -hmm. and that means that drawing boundaries is really hard mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's it gets easier the older you get the more experienced you get But it's really hard. It's really hard to know, like when to know when somebody has crossed a boundary. Yeah. And it's really hard to know how to prevent that and how to deal with it when it happens. But like we've all been told, like, hey, you know, you're not just a person, or you're not just an artist. You're a brand, mm -hmm. and you can either create a fake version of yourself, and that's fine, I guess, or you can be yourself and deal with some of the pitfalls that come with being yourself online, mm -hmm. and. I don't know. Sometimes it's like not always the best advice to to make yourself your 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 quote unquote brand, you know? Yeah. I, I sort of respect people who are like I like to put my name on my work. Mm -hmm. All of my work. I've never had a pseudonym for for my work, even my pinups work. I've always been very proud of mm -hmm. it. But I 
get it. I get it when people are like, oh, my name is, you know, Flower Pot or whatever. Like, it's, <laughs> I get it. It's, 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 you want to separate your online presence from your real life. I mean, quote unquote real life. I think our work is our real life too, but you understand what I yeah, mean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's like your your personal identity versus the online brand, like se separating the two and making it a little harder to find, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a really good way to put that's, it. It's, it is, it's something that is kind of tricky because like you, I decided kind of early on to put my name over work because I'm like, okay, well, if somebody likes my... I don't know, comic or illustration. I just don't want to make it harder for them to find me in case there could be like a potential interesting business opportunity. But yeah, then it's it it does link all the different aspects of, of yourself to your professional persona. And have you ever had yeah. any moment when a working for a studio, you felt like you had to be more careful using your online your socials you know what i mean like sometimes i feel like yeah uh because in the contract sometimes i feel like we kind of have to i don't know i i forget exactly the language of how the contracts are drafted but we we can easily be associated <laughs> with the studio <laughs> even though it's just us yeah i think that's a really great question also pearl's forehead isn't that big but whatever we're going with it <laughs> I think that's a really great question. So I know there are like rules around drawing the characters that you draw professionally mm. in certain situations that are frowned upon. Like you don't, I mean, well, now you can draw Mickey Mouse however you want to, apparently. But uh, <laughs> the Steamboat Willie one, not right, yeah, yeah, true, not right, any right. Mickey Mouse. That's so funny. Yeah, he can be sexy, but only if he's in black and white. <laughs> no, uh, it's 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 tricky. Like you can get in trouble if you're like drawing yeah sexy donald duck or whatever like if you're into that that's cool mm. but so i've never and, and i'm not i don't do a ton of fan art anyway mm. and i and i'm not one of those people that's constantly drawing the stuff that i'm drawing for work at home mm -hmm. i think it's really cool when artists are having that kind of fun but i'm like i have naked men to draw so i'm, <laughs> I'm busy but <laughs> but um yeah I, I i know that's frowned upon but i've never i've personally never run into any any pushback on my personal work and the way i see it is i don't i wouldn't want to work for a company that would have that much control over what i can do outside of work hours mm -hmm. you know frankly i don't care who i'm working for it's none of their business what i'm doing in my free time short of you know horrible crimes <laughs> you know? I, I i really think it's important to be able to express yourself freely as a creative outside of the job mm -hmm. so if i had that issue i i don't know that i'd want to stick around yeah and honestly it's so tied to what i do in my personal work now that it would be kind of impossible to separate myself from it and I think like there are probably some job opportunities maybe I've missed out on or or just, you know, creative opportunities in general because of my personal work. But I try to remember that that is true for everybody, <clears throat> even if they're drawing just, you know, more safe for work stuff They're They're doing it in a style that's not going to be right for every job or they're doing, you know, something tonally that doesn't make sense to convince recruiter to to put you on a certain job or a director or whatever I, I just remember like we're all doing our own thing on some level and no matter what you're doing it's not going to be right for everybody and every, everything and that's okay mm -hmm. but yeah i i get asked a lot about like the nature of my personal work butting butting up against my professional work and it's never to my knowledge it's never been a problem i love that answer that's really great because i feel like a lot of people can get very uh worried about it and it's like very freeing and nice to hear that <laughs> yeah well you have to give yourself permission to do what you feel you need to do mm -hmm. and sometimes that is you know doing something that doesn't really match up with on paper what you do professionally and that's okay i think it's good to have interests and needs outside of work yeah <laughs> whether they're whether they're creative or not like get a hobby yeah 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 <laughs> you know it's it's 
it's good to give your, yourself permission to be authentic to yourself. That can be hard, mm -hmm. but it's important. Yeah, that's so true. I think that's such a good advice, too, for, like, creative health, I think, if I can put it in yeah. any better way. Because when drawing has been your personal like little secret garden for so long in your life and then it becomes your professional career then it, it is really tricky to find that balance and I think well that's an answer that's give giving like a lot of avenues to explore that and, and keep yeah. that like creative I don't know health I don't know the best way I can be the best yeah. what I can come up with <laughs> yeah I mean we think a lot nowadays about mental health mm -hmm. we think think about that and you know everybody's always had physical health in mind but creative health is a thing too <laughs> <laughs> you know being a creatively healthy person is your duty to yourself as a creative professional and if you need to draw like like i see you know artists who work in animation who are outside of work who are doing you know beautiful collages mm -hmm. or like landscape paintings or whatever or like are making beautiful music or they're mm -hmm. rock climbing <laughs> there's a lot of rock climbers in animation <laughs> like people people who are you know channeling their energy elsewhere it's always good for your creative soul yeah i love that and i feel like talking about creativity let's talk about creative block uh do you <laughs> do you experience creative block and if you do how do you deal with it i do i don't know an artist who doesn't who doesn't experience creative block? I am better at getting out of it. It tends not to last longer than a day these days, which is good. I think that's just by virtue of drawing enough. Like, I draw a lot. I draw a lot for work. I draw a lot personally. Um, I always say I don't draw enough, but I think that's, I think we're all really hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. But just by virtue of drawing a lot, I think it means that, like, I'm able to understand that every drawing is a little bit disposable mm -hmm. and I think taking the pressure off is really good. If I'm really hitting a block, the first thing I'll do if I'm trying to be creative is I'll like draw on post-it notes or I'll draw on like crappy legal, like a crappy legal pad or something. The crappier the paper, the better because it means that it feels really disposable and there's no pressure. So like drawing in a way that, that feels like there's no pressure, that's, that's a really good place to start. But honestly, sometimes being creative is not the best way to try and get through a creative block. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the best thing you can do is, for me, it's usually play a video game mm -hmm. or go see a movie. I believe in absorbing other other people's output <laughs> to, to recharge myself sometimes. Uh, nothing can be made in a vacuum. Sometimes you just need that little inspiration. And sometimes you just need your brain to have a break. Mm -hmm. I know these are all probably really common answers, but yeah, just walking away from from your art for a day and just giving yourself again, it's that thing about permission, like giving yourself permission not to make and just go do something else. That that really helps me. It's not perfect. It doesn't work ten you know a hundred a hundred percent of the time. Uh but it but it's but it's good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one. That's a great one. It's it's so hard sometimes to walk away from like a problem that you're trying to solve. But yeah, like finding that moment of like, okay, I'm in a rut. I need to kind of like look at something else for a minute and distract, distract and get yeah. inspired. Distract myself, get inspired. Yeah, it's such a great um, answer. Well, and and we also have to acknowledge like if you're working on a job, whether that's a comic job or an animation job, or you're just doing a commission or an illustration, which honestly commissions for me, I'm, I'm doing better now, but that's where I hit a lot of blocks. Mm. You have to do the job. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's paying you to do it. So it's tough because especially if you're on a, a gig with like a really tight deadline, you, you can't always just walk away for a day. But if you can like get in your car and go to your local coffee shop and get yourself something nice to drink and treat yourself nice for you know, a half hour, an hour, just let your brain like rest for a little bit. I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but it helps. Just take, just take the relaxation where you can get it in those situations. I remember on Magiswords, especially <clears throat> Zoe and I would walk to Starbucks probably every day <laughs> <laughs> and it was right down the street from Cartoon Network, but it was just like a good reason to get up and, you know, give our bodies a break from our chairs and just put something sweet in our 
stupid bodies. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, was, it was, it helped. It helped us wake up. It helped us come back and feel like we're ready to tackle the rest of the day. So even little things go a long way. That's that's a great answer. Is there anything that you would want to plug? Yeah, I have been running a Patreon for about a year. It's patreon.com slash Drew Green. And there are a few tiers. I'm trying to treat it more like a sketchbook. I'm, I'm trying to do more loose work. But if you want, you can also join the sticker club, the pinup sticker club where I will mail you a really cute pinup sticker uh, based on a theme voted on by the patron patrons every month. So check that out. I'm having so much fun with it. It's been really, really cool. And it's a great and relatively inexpensive way to support me. I love that. Yeah. And I love sticker clubs. I've, I've started a sticker club too for my webcomic. And I think it's so fun to make the little design. Nice. And then every month you get your sticker in the mail <laughs> and you're like, ooh merch <laughs> yeah people really seem to like getting that physical thing and everybody's got a water bottle now so you've got a place for stickers yeah that's so true <laughs> yeah and honestly i some of my favorite designs i've ever done have been the stickers i'm february will be my will be my year of doing the stickers every month and i just think they all turned out great and they look real good you know in a place where other people can appreciate them especially if you like a good beefy guy <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got any room on your laptop on your sketchbook or water bottle you know where to get your next sticker <laughs> yeah patreon.com slash drew green yes well that's the end of this great vlog drew thank you so much for being our guest and sharing your story thank you and thanks to your listeners follow us on social media it's at creative vlog where we ask for drunk prompts and questions to ask your guests we've had like a lot more questions coming from youtube so thanks to all of our youtube followers you guys are, are the best Huge thanks to your editor, Clemens, for editing the podcast, Marco for helping us produce the show, and Ibuka for creating the short clips we've been putting out. So these are on TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube shorts. If you love our show, you can support us on Patreon. Becoming a patron gets you early access to interviews and access to our Discord community. But a great way for you guys to support us is to just interact with our content. You can comment on this episode or any of our posts, uh, like and subscribe. If you don't know what to write in the comments, you can just tell us what was uh, your favorite thing that you watched this week. You can see all of Drew's socials in the description of this episode and the link to your Patreon, etc. cetera. Uh, I have been your host, V. Uh, keep being creative and we'll see you next week. Bye.